contribute that um, background on aging in the lung. Um, so I'm supposed to do my own intro. So I'm Claude Lusso. I, I received my PhD in the Institute Pasteur of Lyon um, a couple of years ago, several years ago. Uh, and then went to Hawaii where I did my postdoc um, and get my first um, faculty position there before I moved here six years ago. And throughout all these years, the theme of my research has been extracellular matrix, uh, remodeling, fibrosis, weakening. Um, and I ended up working with the lung, starting with asthma. Um, and then we figured out that there is one particular protein that was very much downregulated, uh, which was the cabulin one protein. And from that on, that was um, my entryway into pulmonary fibrosis and since it's an age related disease then I evolve into aging and um, most particularly I'm interested in senescence. So this talk is going to sort of give a view about what we have been doing um, for the last three years here. Um, some of this work has been published, some is still in um, the revision stage but um, hopefully over the summer we'll be done. Um, so that's why I couldn't disclose it. But anyway, um, so I'm not going, I'm going to preach the choir here because you all know that when you have any organs, the um, aging um, aspect of it is that you have a decline in the physical, the physical function. So any organ that we are going to talk about or anybody is going to look at aging in a specific organ system are going to measure some change in the function compared to younger um, person. So in the case of lung, and this has been done for many, many years, is that we, we have an increase in compliance, decrease in lung elasticity, increase in stiffness of the chest wall. What does all that mean? It means that people have a harder time um, getting their lung filled up and with the air getting out of the lung. It's not going to impede their function. They, they can walk, they can, um, they can move around, they can do that like a normal life. Since everything else in their body is also declining, this is kind of an adaptation of the capability they have. Um, we know that a lot of these change actually are either the result or are the manifestation of the change in the extracellular matrix. So that was for me um, what was interesting in the aging of the lung is that we have dramatic change in the aging lung that are seen in the extracellular matrix protein network, the way the protein are expressed, uh, which protein are there, not there, cross link and, all, and so forth and so on. Um, in other systems that are actually linked to um, the function of the lung by physiology is also the cardiovascular system and the um, kidney system. And all of these organs are going to have also different function that will impact the function of the lung. Um, one of the um, key also in aging organs is that those organs have a decreased resistance to any form of stress. So an oxidative stress could be handled by a young tissue way much easier than the older one. And that's an effect in some of the or two of the major age-related diseases, which is COPD and um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, because we know that this is one of the key factors for uh, creating the disease in, in the patient. So the fact that the tissue biology is less uh, capable of handling any stress adds to um, the development of these diseases, which, by the way, age is an independent factor of any other cause of disease. Um, and again, increases activity to diseases. So, there is a confusion, I think, in terms of, and even as, as we speak um, about the change in the tissue as they age, in terms of becoming fibrotic. So I put those pictures here that you can see. So this is a mouse tissue because it's very hard to get human tissue as they age. Um, but you can see that um, when you look at the alveolar structure, you have some collagen deposition, um, and this is a microcellular strand, so every collagen fibers is going to look red. Uh, and as the mice age, you have this increased thickening and increased deposition of the um, of the collagen and therefore modeling of the extracellular matrix. However, you can still see the structure. So you have a change in the structure, but you don't have the structure of the lung structure as you can see. And this is a pulmonary fibrosis patient compared to a normal one. 
So we talk about phagotic remodeling, we talk about, um, but yet when you look at those pictures, you can tell that this is, we are talking about completely two different mechanisms. And this is also true in the aged kidney. So the aged kidney um, have increased collagen, and here the collagen is actually blue because it's a trachrome staining. Um, and when you have a phagotic kidney, you have loss of the structural function of that particular organ. So yes, there is convergence if you think about accumulation of exosphere matrix, but there is divergence in the terms of you don't have that accumulation in the same place, in the same amount, um, and it's not destroying the tissue. So we have common mechanism between fibrosis and aging because they do end up resulting in change in the same sort of outcome. Um, so as I said, sorry, um, there is oxidative stress, change in inflammation, shortening of telomere and telomere efficiency. Um, those will lead to senescence, and senescence is becoming more and more a link between those age-related diseases and aging, even though we don't exactly know what is the function of the senescence cells in the aging tissue. What we know so far is that they are present and they increase over time, but we don't know what their function is in that particular tissue. And um, what is very important for um, the lung in particular, but also for the brain, is which is not exactly the endothelial barrier, but it's still that vasculature aging of the tissue that creates changes um, downstream that is sort of common across all these organs. So when I'm looking about, uh, when I'm talking about senescence, so cellular, a cell that is becoming senescent you know, is a cell that stop dividing. However, that cells have a changed metabolism, and they are going to release a bunch of new different protein in the, the microenvironment. So those cells are going to actually modify the microenvironment, um, and we I mean, we we suspect that those changes are changing the microenvironment by the protein downloading. Most of the protein downloading have been defined based on the senescent cells in cancer tissue, and uh, a lot of description has been made on the their pro-inflammatory um, cytokine, chemokine. However, we also know that those cells are secreting uh, MMPs, and the MMPs are proteins that are part of the regulation of the extracellular matrix um, homeostasis. And we have some data now that actually those senescent cells are releasing a bunch of extracellular matrix protein, even though, like the alveolar epithelial tissue cells, that are usually not secreting extracellular matrix protein. When they become senescent, they do. So we go through that in the, in, 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 in the top. But there is roughly, when people are talking about um, senescence pathway, there is two, oh, there is two main ones. The P53, P21, and the P16, P11. They are both um, initiated by different mechanisms. So the P53 seems to be more dependent on DNA damage agent, where the P16, P11 are going to be more dependent on the worst oxidative stress. However, when you look at the senescent cells, it's very, very, very difficult to find the cells that is either only P53 positive or only P16 positive. When the senescence pathway are activated, it seems that all of them are activated. Um, and that we don't really have good tools so far to make a distinction between um, those different pathways, what, what is the relevance, and what important it is for that senescence cells. Um, for those of you who know more about the macrophage um, biology, it sounds, to, it sounds to me, based on what the paper that are coming out now, that we are at the stage where macrophage were 20 years ago, 30 years ago, where we said, oh, we have an activated macrophage. Now, and then we, we talked about we have M1 and M2 phenotype, and then you have M1, M2, M3, and then subcategory of M2, blah, blah, blah. Now it becomes a big description thing. And I'm pretty sure for the senescence that we are at that stage where we have put in the same bag all the senescence cells, um, and then we are going to have now have different, um, mark we need to find markers to distinguish those cells and their function in the tissue. Because um, you may know that senescent cells, for example, cellular senescent cells have been involved in amyloidology, which is something that has nothing to do with, with aging. So what else senescent cells are doing there? And so that's the sort of idea that I'm emerging now. So this is what an age round looks like. So this is a, um, 22 year old, and you see they are pink and uh, fluffy and nice, and then you have those 50 years old ones 
there are more doctors, there are more um, if you look at the, step, the tissue section there will be emphysema like there is more edema. So you can see that even visually there is a true difference between those two organs. And you have to remember that the lungs is in contact with the outside environment. So even though it's inside the ribcage, it's in the direct contact with the outside. So he has a lot of um, change due to environment um, pollution and so forth and so on. Um, with the structural change in aging, in particular in the lung, then you, you have muscle change, you have change in the airways, you have change in the prime time, the mechanical property, the cardiac output that is going to influence as the lung function. So aging in the lung, it's again a big bag where we are going to have multiple um, way to approach those changes. In our case, we have been focusing more on the, on the prime time because I'm interested in IPF and therefore since it's a change in the alveolar tissue, that's why I've been focusing on. But by doing that, I end up also looking at the vasculature. Um, so the cellular change that we know occur by increasing inflammatory cells, um, you do have less stem cells and progenitor cells. And that's kind of not completely the whole story. We are not sure if we have less cells or these cells are less potentially activated. Um, so far, there is not clear study distinguishing the two things. And then um, in terms of mode nuclear channel, we know we have impair repair mechanism, accumulation of excess matrix, and activation of TP potassium. <coughs> if I wasn't talking about aging, I could say the same thing for criminal defenses. So we had, um, I, I was lucky that when I moved here six years ago, Dr. Richardson was starting the health science study um, where he was receiving mice from NIA at different time points, eight, um, eight months, 24, 32 months, and even 36 months. Um, and nobody was interested in the lung. So um, I got the lung without really knowing what I was going to do with it at that point. Um, but we, we were able to have the whole collection. And not only we have different age mice, but we also have gender. So we have female and male. And there is some difference. I'm not going to talk about that here today, but there is some differences in the way the age female, the female age compared to the male, which was very interesting, um, in terms, just in terms of lung function. Um, so we did some lung function analysis of the physiology, and we then we went from the organ to the tissue to the cells to have an idea of what's going on. So in terms of the lung function, we were able to reproduce what is known in a human disease, which is the increase um, in airway resistance. We have the increase in compliance, and we didn't have much change in the elastance. So the lung function that this animal seems to have is comparable to what we, could, what we know is happening in human. And that was important because you always get those questions about is it the mouse model really relevant for any human pathology or any human so at least in terms of physiology, those animals, those, I mean, those animals, the mouse and the human seems to age the same way. Um, we were lucky to collaborate with Dr. Um, Eric White, um, who has been establishing the way to decellularize the lung. So after a different process, you can go from a lung with tissue and cells and protein and all that to the scaffold. Um, that's why it's white, because it has been decellularized. And you can see the process of that. He has been publishing that a um, couple of years ago. So we use the same method to decelerize the lung of the mouse um, to get an idea about what are the extracellular matrix protein that was the um, difference between the 8 months old and the 24. So even between the 8 and the 24, we are talking about maybe having a difference between somebody who is in his 40s to somebody who is in his 80s. So we are still, even at 40, we are still in the aging process. But we are looking at more, the, uh, more um, dramatic changes. We exclude from this study the 36 months old mice because actually they were more showing surviving profile rather than really continuing declining of the function. And then what we're in, surprised to see is that yes, we do, we do have the change in the collagen associated protein as we were expecting, but we also have change in um, protein that regulate TGF beta signaling pathway. So for example, the cavillin one, the cavillin one was um, declined, which meant that the TGFP that CN pathway could be um, more, with, um, more free, which is what we see. We know TGFP that CN was increased. Um, and it's not because the level of TGFP that is increased, it's because the signaling is increased. And that was a reflection of that. 
Um, then look at some of the other proteins because I didn't really know how to characterize them. Um, and there are a lot of them involved in the tie junction. So that's what we're starting to think. Well, maybe we should look into this endothelial barrier um, um, aging process because maybe that's something that um, could be um, learned from there. So we confirmed that um, as the mice age, they develop uh, this increase of extracellular matrix collagen deposition, microcell shred, um, and red staining. And then we did the quantification of the content of the collagen in the tissue we were also having this increase in collagen content. Um, so quantification of this, collagen content. And we also measure uh, a biomarker in the urine of the mice, which is the pyrimidogene. The pyrimidogene is a byproduct of degradation of collagen. Uh, what is interesting with collagen is the more collagen you have deposited, the more collagen you are going to have degraded. It's just that the threshold of deposition is greater than the degradation. So, but this has been shown, for example, in um, other, uh, like in liver fibrosis, the progression of the liver fibrosis was associated with the increase of purinine in the urine. So we did that with our mice, and sure enough, we have an increase in purinine in the urine, matching the increase in collagen deposition. Okay, so all of this is kind of no, no. Sorry, sorry uh, but that that increase in the urine could be because of fibrosis anyway, right? Yes. So it's kind of because it's an age down. So yes. Yes, it's not specific to that. So, because you also have accumulation of collagen in the kidney mm -hmm. or um, in other organs. So, yes, so that accumulation of collagen was in the urine yeah. is a global measurement. Um, but that was nice to see that in the, what we see in the organ specifically. Right. But that's a good point. So, as far as up to here, we were just sort of like double checking that what we could expect in the aging round, in the, those mouse model, are what we expect. Um, we didn't have any clue of what we had these changes yet. So the urine suspect the fibroblasts, which is the cells that secrete the collagen, were activated. Were activated. So we have increase of the, um, the amount of fibroblasts, myofibroblasts in the tissue, um, increase at the protein level and at the cells. Um, we do have increase of the TG petacinin in the show. Um, the increase of the activation of the synaptic pathway. So okay, so we have that, but. Those increases were not enough to explain what's going on. So we were, what, it, what else is going on? We look at senescence. So all markers of senescence are increased by Western blood and by immunostain. So we have more senescent cells. And then when we look more specifically, those senescent cells um, that you can see here with the marker P16 were also the one that are going um, to be associated with this increase of alpha stain. So those fibroblasts that are staying in the tissue kept their markers of myofibroblasts but become senescent. So we knew we had a change in the ex expression. And then showing up when we look at two, we look at two by immune staining, but we had a, um, I, I did that job in, back in France last summer. We did a microarray and we saw that we had increase in all kinds of different um, extracellular matrix. But the main ones were osteoprotein and genesis. And that's important to me as an extracellular matrix person. I haven't seen much in terms of collagen 1, collagen 3, but I've seen a lot of change in those proteins that are actually the protein that are the adhesion protein. And they prepare the bedding in which those collagen can be deposited and be making more stable. So actually, when you are at like between 3 months and 12 months, what's happening is that the tissue is getting ready to have this accumulation of collagen. And it's sort of like trying to repair and not being able to completely heal. Um, and we have seen that, that trend in a lot of different cases that we have been running. Um, interestingly, the same thing was happening with uh, when we compare 22 to 58 year old tissue um, human. We have this accumulation of collagen. We have the increase of marker of um, senescence in the prime time and mainly around the vessel as well. Um, and then those cells that are um, positive for P16 were also positive for tenacity. So like in the mouse, we, con we went back to the human tissue and we confirmed that what we saw in the mouse was actually happening in the human tissue. So 
accumulation of senescent cells. And those cells that, if they are not senescent, do not produce this extracellular matrix protein, now are uh, secreting those extracellular matrix protein. So the senescent cells are directly contributing to this excess of extracellular matrix that we were able to um, detect. Um, and then when we count the, the number of senescent cells, and here we have a P16 marker, um, to know what is the distribution of the cells. Um, as the mice age, we have increase of senescent cells, but mainly in the vasculature, like we have seen in the human, in immunostaining. So now we put together the two things, that okay, we saw that we have changed the tie junction, and we seem to have more senescent cells. Do we see any change in the expression of protein that are specific to this tie junction in the lung? Um, so we look at protein 5. Protein 5 is on the endothelial side of the um, tie junction, and the protein 18 are specific to alveolar uh, epithelial cells. And in both cases, we have decrease of the expression of this protein. Um, so as the mice age, they lose their tie junction, and those vasculars and epithelial cells are becoming more senescent. And another way to assess that, if there is that leakage um, that's not so strong, is by measuring the protein concentration in the BL. So you inject one ml of PBS in the lung of the mice, you take that out, and you uh, measure the concentration of protein. You are not supposed to have um, protein um, in the BL, and especially not albumin, because that means that it comes from the leakage of the endothelial epithelial barrier. But in this case, we do. So not only we know we have the tie junction that expression that is decreasing, but the, the, there is a physical consequence of being more edema lung, which is also known that the aged lung are more edematic than the young one. So then we establish our work hypothesis. We say, okay, when you have long tissue, everything is fine. You have the tie junction that are strong between um, the epithelial cells and in endothelial cells, but that as you age you have an increase in this paracellular permeability by increasing of the number of senescent cells and the loss of those tie junction. This process in aging kind of mimic what you see in acute lung injury when you have the stimulation of the myofibroblast um, by trying to repair. And I think this is what we see um, in our lungs. Now, is that a specific mechanism? Like, what is the signaling pathway that could control for this um, for for this change in the way the cells behave. Because also we were, I was here, I was more really inclined to look in the rapamycin pathway and the mTOR pathway. Um, so as the mice age, we do have the increase of the mTOR pathway. And again, it's a global measurement in the lung. Um, so we were able to have our um, access to sample of mice that are being trained with rapamycin. So there is different condition here. So either the mice have been trained for a long time at low dose or short term at low dose or high dose for short term. But anyway, all these mice were, um, we got the sample when the mice were 28 months old. And what we saw is that no matter what um, the treatment is, the mTOR pathway is suppressed in those, um, in, this, in the lung tissue. However, in our case, we saw the difference in the expression of those um, tie junction only when we were on the high dose of rapamycin. Any low dose condition, short term, long term, didn't affect the, um, the expression of this tie junction protein. And so does the um, extracellular matrix remodeling. At low dose, we, we keep on having the accumulation of collagen as the mice age, which we don't have though on the high dose. So, um, and the same with um, alpha smooth selectin uh, positive cells, they were less in the high dose level. So what seems to happen is what, when we have this progressive loss of endothelial barrier with aging, we seem to promote some of this age-related remodeling of the lung tissue by increasing the number of senescent cells, in particular in the vasculature. However, when we treat with rapamycin, we and high, at, at 42 ppm, which is not like a high, high dose, but it's higher than the 14, um, we seem to regret to control the senescence profile, protect the loss of the tie junction, and not have so much of the remodeling in the tissue. Is those 
um, loss of endothelial and epithelial barrier contribute to the edge of tissue and to be prone to IPF. Um, so that's what also one of the questions that we are being very um, interested in. So we know that in older, um, in the young mice, three, three months old, compared to mature mice, well, not nine, nine months old, when we give them one injection of bleomycin that trigger um, pulmonary fibrosis, we have an increase in collagen expression, um, deposition in the, in the older animal. Um, and then when we, um, we let those mice age and collect later, we know that in the young animal, it's reversible, so the collagen content go back. Um, in the old animal, the collagen level stays still higher. And we, it wasn't so much because we have an increase in collagen deposition expression. Um, we do have a significant decrease in the degradation of collagen. So the accumulation here could be here could be more because we have less degradation rather than more um, synthesis. But also that what we um, were interested in was okay. Can we tell if the senescence is involved in this pathway? Because we have seen in different in other models that when we remove the senescence cells in a fibrotic condition, not aging, in the in the fibrosis prone um, disease. Um, we were able to control the collagen deposition. Um, again, so this is the carrier one deficient bleo model, but this has also been shown by other people affecting with the fibrosis. Um, so yes, as the mice age um, and they are injured by bleomycin, they have more senescence, and we can show that by the MH2A, which is the P53 pathway, or by the P21 expression. And those values, by the way, are statistically significant. Um, do we have the loss of this endothelial barrier? When when you look at the young mice, you do have um, a kind of partial um, loss of the um, Claudine 18 expression. The Claudine 5 um, doesn't change. However, when you have the old mice, that factor is stronger. So we have a dramatic loss of Claudine 5 and the Claudine 18 that may, may go back. So yes, the loss of this alveolar um, endothelial epithelial barrier seems to be even more of a problem when you age. And maybe here we are 21 days, um, so it may be not so much that um, it's a problem, but the mice doesn't seem to be able to recover from that loss. And I think that's also goes under that category of um, having problems with repair. The mTOR pathway is dramatically increased. Uh, so we, see, we think that um, mTOR again might have um, uh, an idea, and we have some study going on with Dr. Peters to try to treat the mice, blue mice, with rapamycin and see if we can prevent fibrosis and if we can prevent some of these markers um, to go down or up to any more um, But definitely we know that the senescent cells play a critical role in this fibrotic pathway because when we use um, mice and we uh, have bleomycin, um, here is the bleomycin model, when we treat those mice with the telomerase activator by preventing senescence, we were able to limit the fabric deposition. So definitely, um, and, um, the, um, the senescence, um, the cellular senescence process is critical for um, IPF. Um, so we made that by beta gal, by MH2A, by different markers, and all of these data show the same thing. When we treat with telomerase activator, we prevent senescence, and um, we didn't have the fibrosis. And again, um, then we were, that's what the work we published, and we didn't look at the endothelial epithelial barrier. But now knowing what we know, we went back to our sample and say, okay, what's going on now if we treat those mice with um, um, Terrorist activity. What happened to the expression of Claudine 5 and Claudine 18? And as you can see here, what is this one? When we treat the mice um, after bleomycin with the telomerase activator, with um, then we protect the expression. I mean, we protect the loss of expression of Claudine 5 and Claudine 18. So again, we still have the same players here. When you don't have cellular senescence in the vasculature not loss of the um, tight junction, you protect the endothelial barrier, barrier, you have less remodeling. So definitely this process is playing a critical role. 
So in aging, um, in the main conclusion, the detection of senescent cells in age long um, seems to be critical, especially to maintain the integrity of the vessel and the interaction between vessel and prime time. These new senescent cells are now secreting ECM protein, even though they're not typically cells that are secreting protein, this kind of protein. And the loss of tight junction and parasol affirmability play a role in age associated with the And upon injury, the cells are going to go furthermore into um, senescence. And the prevention of the senescence protects from purposes as well as protecting from the loss of those tight junction. So here are the people that have been helping me along the way. Um, my technician, Shirusa, who has been a trooper, um, and she has been able to, um, and we had a great help from two of the MSTAR students um, that was really great. And Greg is still in the lab working up this tight junction um, story. Um, Dr. Richardson, of course, gave us the advice. Um, and I got great support from um, Dr. Peters in this area. We did our funding, and I'm um, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so the rapamycin traded animals, did you test the lung function on those? Yes. So they were protected from the age effect? Yes. So um, so we so we did the um, for the rapamycin, we didn't do the one that um, received the rapamycin in the food. Um, like the sample I showed you. Um, but we did that with inhalation. So we actually have um, make the, um, the rock I'm missing in attached to small particles and then we can give that to the mice by um, like a nebulizer. And those mice have it, have help protecting from the increase. Okay, when you have fibrosis, um, you have an increase in compliance. When you treat those blue mice with rapamycin, you don't have it. But I don't have this particular data in the aging mice with rapamycin because um, that was again that was sample that were given to me um, because they were going to fall and nobody was interested in that. Um, but we that's what we repeat that study with the rapa and we harvest the last lung tissue last week, so we are processing the sample. Now. So the the rapa we do where are uh, three months old. We want to have a baseline, and then if we see any difference, then we will, we will need the seed to repeat that in all the mice. But for now, um, it was just to say, okay, is rapa in the inhaled form can prevent fibrosis in the young mice. If it cannot in the young mice, it will not do anything in the old mice. Yes? So the changes in the tight junctions, do you think that that's allowing things to get from the blood vessels into the lung parenchyma, or is it yes. the, the tight junctions are also signet complexes? And That's a good question. So I think because we also have this increased edema in the lung, I think it has to do a lot with this extra de in the lung tissue. And we know in um, acute lung injury that create the damage and that create um, the activation of the inflammation pathway and the myofibroblast and the accumulation of gland trying to repair. So that's why I have been more gearing toward that, um, that those studies. However, it's true. Um, and one of the things that's interesting, for example, is that the expression of protein 5 and protein 18 have been shown to be under the expression of dirt. You know that dirt, the telomeres, dirt. Yeah, has so they have the function of adding the I mean the maintaining the length of the telomere, da 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 da. But also TURF has um, is a transcription <coughs> factor that regulates expression of different genes. And among them is clean high and clean eighteen. So that could also be part of okay. some of these mechanisms that you are talking about. Um, there is um, the, the pathway actually has been well studied, so um, we could use our blood and and determine if we have the same activation of those um, intermediate um, and it could be easy. but I think the, the plain um, um, presence of this um, edema is already creating damage um, and so more so in the in the age lung. so I think the lung tissue as far as I can tell from the mouse um, seems to be already trying, struggling to um, maintain um, their 
vascular structure and contain this sort of continual in micro injury. Um, and then when you hit with the bleomycin, then everything is just like it's overwhelmed and they cannot repair. And that's what you see with the, a lot of those protein. In the, in the young mice, they reverse the able to bounce back. In the old mice, they cannot bounce, which is more actually a reflection of what's happening in IPF patient because the, the IPF patient never reverse. So, Claude, two questions. One, probably the largest clinical disease where we leak proteins is ARDS. So, if you get shock or you get sepsis, bacterial injury, the capillaries leak and your albumin and your VAO goes up, etc. I'm just curious if anybody, if you know if anybody's doing similar work in acute lung injury, because we see people in their 20s and 30s who end up in the ICU, when you look at them three and four years later, they usually have pretty severe fibrotic lung. And so you save their life, but their quality of life is really quite poor, uh, even when you follow them out long term. So I'm just curious, I know that's not the area of the talk, but do you know if anybody is looking at the same kind of pattern of injury and why you go into fibrosis when you acutely leak, even yes. in young patients? So actually, it's because I read some of this paper, knowing what data I have, like say, well, that to me, that seems to be mimicking. So yes, so they have established that pathway that when you have this leakage, then you stimulate the inflammation, and especially the macrophage. Those macrophages are going to become those M2 macrophages and release prophyrotic factors that are going to activate the fibroblasts, making them making them myofibroblasts, and they are going to secrete um, those extracellular matrix that you collagen that you see then later in life. So yes, there is a, a um, that that that's why I get inspired to to see okay in the aging one at the lower I mean not as acute and not as dramatic as in AR, yes, but that seems to be sort of mimicking what's happening, and that's why I got to check the coding 5 and coding 19 and so forth as well. And then I guess the second question is another very hot topic is when you look at people with asthma as they age, by the time they get to be 40, about 20% look like they have COPD, and by the time they get to be 60, about 50% or more have all the characteristics of COPD <coughs> and no longer asthma. It means they've gone from reversible obstruction to irreversible obstruction by definition of the two diseases. So you were looking at mostly collagen that was <coughs> not airway, it was around the vessel and in the parenchyma. <coughs> but did you look at in the same injury model, an aging model, just to see what happens in the airways in terms of... Yes, so, yes, we have done that before, and specifically for the um, emphysema part, we have looked at the elastin expression, and we saw the decline in elastin expression. And in the microarray that I showed the protein, the proteosomic analysis, that was the same thing. The elastin and the elastin ray protein expression were lower. Um, so you have... <coughs> the aging, when you look at the amount of collagen in the airways themselves. So the collagen goes up in, but aging. in aging and the elastin goes down. So you have both um, yeah. both roles. Now if you look at what of some primary work and I know I'm um, like some of the senes the, the fibroblasts that are in Wunihini, when they become senescent, those fibroblasts seems to be more the one that are going to release all these MMPs to try to um, reverse the um, wounding and maintain the going into the closure. Now, if you look at what happened in the epithelial cells, they are the ones <coughs> who seem to secrete more of the extracellular matrix protein. So that's why I say, well, based on our work that we have seen, but also what other people are um, putting out now, it seems that by becoming a senescent cell, this senescent secret profile is different depending on what cells you are talking about. And um, that could explain why in the aging realm, where we have both of these type of cells, you have emphysema-like um, features, <coughs> and you still have accumulation of collagen. So you have both going on. It seems to be seemingly not the same, but actually um, they are sort of a combination of the action of two different cells. That, I mean, that based on what we have so far, 
that seems to be what we see. And that's why we want to isolate specifically those. So we were able to get a mouse um, that um, when they become senescent and turn the P16 promoter on, they become fluorescent, so we can isolate them by flow. Um, and then by sorting <coughs> them with different markers, we can isolate the epithelial cells that we blast. And we are um, in the process of analyzing their secretory profile in the age mice to establish that is that is the all the senescent cells are secreting the same thing, or do you have by cell type a different profile that explains the change in the balance? Yes. Yeah, just have, I have so when you put the uh, you treat the old animals like the cell mice, do you see the TCM deposition more in the next to the vessels or everywhere? No, it's everywhere. It's it's um, they also go. F um, they are increase in the remodeling in the tissue will appear sooner. Usually when you have old mice, you have to wait maybe 10 days before you can start to see some of this remodeling happening. In the old mice, it will occur within the first week. So not only it's more, but sooner. And then it's stay there, it's stay there. It doesn't drop. So there is a change in the response. So we also look at inflammation, because unfortunately the bleomycin if I'm, I'm just seeing an inflammation that could um, alter the response because you know as you age the inflammation response is different than that. Um, we haven't seen any difference in based on the differential and some of the like interleukin 4 or interleukin 13 um, TGF beta on the early stage of the um, of the disease they, they didn't have any statistical difference. So I don't think that the change we see um, in terms of the matrix is due to an alteration of the the way the bleomycin induced injury in the mice. Because it could have been just as simple as that. That's why you see the difference. But not on the parameters we have been measuring. And there is a couple of studies out there publishing by different groups. Um, and they are reporting the same thing, that they have more collagen because more remodeling in the age mice. And that stays. So it seems that this is becoming a common commentary. And if you think about the aging, um, the IPF population, we have we are dealing with older people. So and we say, oh, it's a reversible disease. The mouse model is not compatible with what disease is. Sure, if you compare a 20 year old and a 17 year old, maybe that's why we don't use the right the mice at the right age to study those diseases. It's a, it's always a cost issue and all that. But if you put yourself in the right condition, you have the model that means way much more what's happening in the Thank you. Okay, please uh, remember to sign in if you do not find the credits and you will receive an evaluation uh, for after uh, today's presentation. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, next week we're not having the grand round. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. That's correct. Okay, graduation.